for coaches who have thought through a system of play, they usually end up with like some core principles that they are able to use as kind of for building blocks for the players to understand, like, this is what we're really trying to do in our zone or in our press or in our whatever. What were those for you? Yeah, most of the time we have been pretty, pretty standard pack line, man to man defense. And how can we take those same principles, how we close out, how can we incorporate how we close out and not change it, where our help is and not change it. If we go from man to a two, three to a one, three, one, how can all of our defensive fundamentals carry over? As we started looking at the one, three, one, we played a two, three zone uh, where we went man to man on certain passes. Um, and, and it had been successful, but teams were starting to figure it out maybe a little bit. And so we were still looking for that next change up that could help us. Uh, so we went man to man. If the ball went to the high post, we went man to man. If the ball went to the low block, any penetrating pass. So if it penetrates our zone, we were matching up and going man to man. And, and so it was good, but still like teams could run their zone offense against it. Most teams have one, maybe two plays against the one, three, one. Uh, teams may have eight to nine plays against the two, three. Teams are going to have 35 to 40 man sets at our level. And so you cut down dramatically on the amount of sets that you got to prep for, that you got to go through. It, it, takes, it takes the coach of the other team sometimes out of the game. And so the one, three, one, allowed us to show something and then it gave us the flexibility to stay one three one to change to a two three or to change to man to man and so there would be some possessions where we would play all three of them in a possession and so how do you how do you let the other team how do they run their stuff against that i mean there there is no offense you can look up all the clinics you want how do you go how do you attack a one three one to a two three like how do you what what offense are you going to run and, and so it took the other coach out of the game and it, all right, they're one or two best players are going to really have to go make plays and make some contested shots against us. Talk to me about the, the responsibilities and the player positions within the one through one. So we did a little different. Most teams put their point guard or smallest guy on the baseline in a traditional like one, three, one. We put our four, uh, which for us, our four is pretty much our biggest guard. So somebody 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six in that range, um, that's fairly mobile, athletic, can cover each corner, but gives us some size down there blocking out. Um, weak side rebound, responsibilities, those type of things. So we liked having our four there. Then we put our five in the middle of the one through one. That's pretty standard, traditional. Um, and then on each wing, uh, we would have our one or our three. And we did that. So if we wanted to change defenses, uh, which I'll go through in a minute, it allowed us one side of the floor, we would go man, one side of the floor, we would go zone, depending on what corner it was in because of where our point guard was. So we always went to certain spots on, on certain sides of the floor, like the one had to go to this side. He couldn't go to the other side because then we would get mixed up how we were rotating. And then we would put our uh, two man, who was 6'2", 6'3", you know, at the top of him, somebody that, that was fairly athletic, fairly long arm, could stunt some and uh, make some plays up there for us and make them throw lobs and bounce passes. How about the actual positioning of the players? Where are they standing on the yeah. floor? Is there anything unique to that? Um, so we, we, you know, if you look at um, – Ole Miss comes to mind, UAB does it. They play a really, really aggressive 1-3-1 one, one zone where those wings are really charging the ball handler as soon as he comes across the half line, almost trapping it there at the half line, really extending it. And we we wanted to be more more compact with it. So we would our pickup point for the point of the 1-3-1 one, one was right at the half line. And, and his job was to try to get the ball on one side of the floor. Don't let it stand there in the middle. Get it to a side. And then our wings were playing NBA three. Um, we said we were always playing out and up, so out to the sideline and then up to the ball, funneling it more towards where that five man was in the middle. The five man is feet on the three-point line. You know, we didn't want him to walk into threes. We were out and up, NBA three on the side, half line, getting it to a side at the top, middle, feet on the three point line. The bottom guy is always 
about two steps off the block on the lane line, getting ready to get the ball side corner. And I think one mistake a lot of people make when they play a one three one is they drop the opposite wing too far to the basket. And you just give like one pass across the floor and it's a it's a walk in three right there because most teams attack a one three one with a two guard front. So we were about a step below the elbow, probably. And we really worked a lot on reading shoulders and eyes. So my butt, instead of being butt to the baseline there, would be more angled to where I could see the ball handler kind of diagonal from me in the slot. I can see somebody if they start to, to baseline cut me for a lob on the baseline, and I can get to this guy right here in the opposite slot, which is my side, to contest the three. And the middle guy, I'm assuming, stays relationship kind of to the ball in the middle, but yeah. then drops. Yeah, so feet on the three-point line, always between you hear the ball and the basket, but that's pretty pretty standard. So we don't want – we want him to not really be in a defensive stance either. Like we're trying to put our biggest guy right there. Uh, so almost where he's, I guess you'd say, almost look like he's doing jumping jacks, arms up, moving around uh, to where it's harder for that. So if the ball handler sees the point guy kind of stunting at him back and forth and that the, the point guy should have said this plays between the lane lines. Like he never he never crosses that. Like he's got that middle channel. That's where he plays in. And so he's stunting and back, stunting and back, out and up on the wing. And then our middle guy is just being active with long arms right there, trying to not let the ball handler see those back cuts to the rim for lobs. The stunt I know is a big part of what mm -hmm. you work on that maybe yeah. you'll talk about a little bit more when we get to the drills yeah. a little bit. Yeah, we uh, we teach them, and, and this is something I heard on, uh, I think Jay Wright talked about it, how they played their one, two, two, three quarter core zone. He goes, you, you, you come in little and you back up big. So you're going to come in little, like hands down, stunt, like I'm about to come get it. And then you're going to back up about to the midline with, with high active hands. And if you can do that, then that pretty much ensures it's got to be a lot of pass over the top. The worst thing, and, and guys will want to do it all the time up there, is the jump. You get up there and you start jumping around, a good guard is just going to lift you up with an eye fake. You're going to get out of a stance. You're going to jump. He's going to snake it to the middle. And the one three one is is pretty toast at that point. So not jumping, not leaving your feet, like in little, back up big. The other thing they want to do is they're going to chase the ball. They're going to chase it back and forth. And if you do that, they're going to pass it around you, and you're going to wear yourself out up there. So, you know, you're, you've got that middle channel. You've got those lane lines. That, that lane line is pretty much a stop sign for you. You'll back up pretty much to the, we call it the tape, the midline, the middle of the floor right there, and then you can stun again, but you're just playing that kind of cat and mouse game right there. Let me first ask, I want to talk about, ask about rotations and first ask about just the obvious one. Ball goes down to the corner. Mm -hmm. Are you doing what's like standard and is there anything that's not standard special so, that you do? Yeah, so if we stay in the one three one and we're not changing defenses, which we had one call for that where we would stay one three one the whole possession. So if it goes over our head to the to the corner, um, some people trap it. We I don't I didn't trap it. We just let the four man close out and cover it, and then we were pretty much in our man to man basic fundamental positioning at that point. So we didn't want to give up the baseline but we weren't forcing the middle, pretty square close out in the corner. That wing is now dropping into his gap where he can stunt on any type of middle penetration. The five man is now dropping to the block, protecting any type of post up, flashes, baseline drive. He's there to stop it. We pretty much turned it into a trap on the baseline. Our opposite wing is now foot on the midline, basic help position man to man. Our top guy is now dropping to the nail basic help position there. So we look just man-to-man -man principles at that point. And then as the ball comes back out, our zone lifts wherever the ball goes, and we kind of move into our back to our one three, one spots. But we close out. We really try to chop our feet, contest the shot, not get beat off. We talk a lot about winning the first dribble. Show your hands, move your feet, stop it with your chest. Don't foul. Don't give up the baseline. You got help right there to stunt. Um, if they do start to get to the middle on you, um, and that would, that would be a, the only difference how we cover the corners if the ball had been skipped from one side of the floor to the opposite corner. Um, then our, our low man can't cover that. That wing has to take it. He goes on the top shoulder. 
forces it baseline. And now that bottom defender of the one three one is recovering to the ball. And we pretty much force a baseline drive, trap it, the five drops to the basket. Um, so over our head ball side, the bottom guy takes it skipped across to the corner. That opposite wing will close out on the top side, force it baseline and the bottom guy will rotate over and almost trap it on a baseline drop. So I would assume, because what you just described for me, that ball goes in the corner, it looked very much like a 2-3 zone. It can. Even though you're still in man. And then what's the trigger there to go ahead and make it a 2-3 zone? I'm big. Offensively, defensively is how can we have some continuous flow, some rules, but we don't rule ourselves to death, but we've got two or three rules that everybody knows, and – we can play out of it and I'm not screaming a thousand different calls to try to get us in stuff. So if, if the ball was on a wing and let's say we had our three men as the ball side wing and the ball went over his head to the corner. All right. We were in man to man because that meant our point guard, which was the opposite wing has now dropped to the basket pretty much. And we did not want him to be the back line of our two, three. And so anytime he was dropped to the to the block, to that uh, help position with his foot on the tape, we were man to man. And so if it went over the three man's head, he went to the same side every time. Our point guard went to the same side every time. If it went over his head, then we were screaming. Uh, the players were fist, fist, fist. We're in man now. And so you would match up with whoever was in your area. You're going to a spot. You're finding a matchup. Not, con- not concerned really with a lot of size at that point. And then we can fix it throughout the possession if we need to get back like size. But most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, where they went, there was another guard for the point guard. The five was dropping to cover the block, which a five man's at. Um, Our four, who we said was pretty much a a bigger guard, could cover a baseline runner who most of the time is a shooter that's not going to put on the floor right away. They're running a guy on the baseline against us. Um, So it it worked out personnel-wise 90% of the time on that. Do offenses attempt to screen anywhere in the zone? And does that change anything about what you just described? So they do. Um, I would say ball screen wise, they will come try to set a step up or flat screen on the top of the zone. What we try to do is we say we, we almost ignore the screen. I guess it would almost be like icing it. Like, okay, you want to come screen me there. Our five is already there as if he's kind of dropped in an ice type coverage below the screen and we're trying to funnel it to him anyways. So we just kind of ignored it. And if they try to side screen us and go across the floor, then we just went underneath it and we just stayed in our one through one baseline screens. A lot of teams will go two guard front, three guys on the baseline, try to screen for a baseline runner. We always were trying to sit on top of it, never get caught below it. Uh, with our bottom guy trying to help cover the corners, always above the block. Like if you can be above the block, it's going to be really hard to pin you in and get those things in the corner. If you get down there below the block and you turn your head, you're going to get hit by a lot of screens. You just mentioned a couple, you know, drawbacks, negatives, warnings. Do you have any other that you guys have have talked to some coaches, you know, rebounding, we really need to work on rebounding out of this, or do you have things like that that you're like, we have to minimize this if we're going to be successful? Well, I think you got to have really active hands. Like we we can't allow direct line passes. If they're going to direct line passes, penetrate passes, anything other than a lob or bounce pass, I think you're fairly vulnerable in it. So your guys have to be good at stunting. They got to have active hands. They got their positioning has to continuously change as the ball is moving. We talk about moving on airtime in the one three one. If you are not moving as the ball is in the air, you're going to be late a lot. Uh, to whether that's contesting the shot on a skip or just being in your next spot where you need to be for help. So moving on airtime, you know, active hands where they can't make penetrating passes. I think you've got to communicate anytime there's a high post flash. There's a soft spot in the one three one So if the ball's on the right side of the floor, the five man's between the ball and the basket, our opposite wing has dropped enough to protect the, the lob. Around that opposite elbow, there's a kind of a soft spot in the zone you can creep into. And allowing our, our fives have to know it. Our, our point guard who just dropped has to talk to them. Hey, you got one on your right side right here. You got one on your right side. So he's kind of got a hand right there in that passing lane. Because if he gets it there, if it gets just like any zone, if it gets to the middle of the zone, it's, you're, you're in some trouble. 
And if it went to the middle of the zone, we, we would try to match up and go man to man. We try to take some of our same two, three principles and not, not change them. All right. We're one, three, one. So if it goes to the high post in the one, three, one, we're staying, but if it goes in the two, three, we're changing. Like to me, that's too much thinking one zone does one thing, one does another, any high post catch one, three, one, two, three. If we play a one, two, two, like we're going to go man to man and get matched up. Um, I think we have to keep that stuff universal. I think we have to keep how we close out universal. I think our gap help has to be universal, no matter man zone, what kind of zone it doesn't matter. Those things kind of have to always be um, a given on those, on those rules, being able to have somebody on the baseline that can cover the corner and, I mean, that, that's the hardest spot to play. So you need somebody down there with a little something to them that, you know, coach, I had to cover this corner and then I got to get over there and cover that. That's what you got to do. And sometimes you got to navigate a screen and then you were closed out here. They're moving it too quick. Our guys up top aren't doing a good enough job making lobs and bounce passes. And you're, you're working pretty hard down there. Um, so that the weak side rebounding, I think in any zone is always an issue. All right, so I'm assuming you do a lot of five on five, but to get to that, where do you start and what do you do when you break it down into smaller groups? So initially we're gonna we're gonna go through it just pretty much me breaking down every position. So we're gonna teach them um, the rotations. Uh, we'll put five guys out. All right, we're gonna say, all right, we're the balls on the right side or threes here. The ball goes over his head. Uh, now we're, we're morphing our one, three, one into man to man. And this is where everybody should be balls on the other side of the floor. It goes over his head. All right. So it went over a point guard's head. Now our three has dropped to the ball side opposite, opposite block of where the ball is. And we're going to stay two, three now based on the corner. So the right corner, we were going man to man, the left corner, we were going two, three. And so we were changing defenses just based on where the ball went. Uh, which gave us a big advantage too because, well, Coach, they went 1-3-1. One, one. Let's just throw it over his head. They're going to go man-to-man this time. We're going to back it out, run our man offense for 20 seconds. Mm. Well, if on the other side we go 2-3, most of the time players aren't going to figure that out. Um, in the heat of things, coaches probably aren't going to figure it out either. Um, and then you have a call where you stay 1-3-1 one, one the whole time. And so it's, it's continually like we don't know when we throw it to the corner what we're going to get on the other side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there would be possessions where we would go one, three, one. They go over a point guard said we would go to a two, three. Our rule in the two, three was any penetrating pass, we go man to man. So we could play a one, three, one for two passes. We could play a two, three for two passes. They hit the high post and we go man to man for the last. 10 seconds to the shot clock or whatever it might be. So we would we would explain all of that. Like this corner's this, this corner's that, then this is where we're changing our defense. If the ball is passed here to the high post, this is our, our rules still apply. If they come in ball screen, like we're gonna walk them through probably too many scenarios, honestly, first. Mm-hmm. And then we're gonna start talking about your basic ways to play it. How to stun at the top, how to be out and up on the wing, the five man, how big are you supposed to be? baseline runner i think if you start with that type of stuff first and they don't understand the whole part of it i think it's hard for them then to translate it when you do want to put it together Mm -hmm. so i'm always probably going to give them too much early on um and so then when you go back and you start teaching the details of it they're like oh yeah that makes sense because i understand the big picture of it um i think there's too much drills early not enough five like we we never do uh, it's a Man to man here, we never do four man shell because the the rotations are totally different than when you go five people. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're completely different. So why are we going to do it that way? I think some like I love small sided games, three on three, direct, simple. Like this is the exact thing we're working on, and it translates to five on five. But if it doesn't translate to five on five, then we try to stay away from it. Do you do any kind of like working with the top? two guys or the top three guys and break it down to maybe like box idea there. Yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll probably do our point, a wing and the five because those three guys are always kind of moving. If, if I'm stunting in, then the wing may need to be backing up some. And then as that point starts to back up some, I need to come up a little bit. So it's always like playing off of each other. And the five is always kind of, he may stunt some, he may come up and then back up a little bit too, but always kind of playing that same area. If that ball gets, I didn't talk about this, we call it a bad beat. Like if he gets beat bad off the bounce, 
and he and the guards driving it. Then we let the fine man just sit down and take it, and we kind of funnel everything out. The point's going to drop to the gap to prevent the nail drive. The wing's going to get to the gap to help prevent anything kind of getting through that slot, and the five's going to sit down and try to take it right there and push it back out. Because I don't want three guys on the ball. Like, that That will break you down in a hurry. So we're never three on the ball. That that drive, the five is taking it, and then we're trying to get gap help, and that opposite wing is going to be dropped even lower now protecting the basket than he probably was before. Um, if they pick the dribble up way out by the half line, we've done it a couple different ways. We turn around and pretty much deny every pass out after that. So if they come across the half line and he's looking over his coach and they can't figure, he takes takes it and just picks it up and he's a step past the half line, then we're going to have a call for it. You turn around, deny, and he hopefully he's going to have to stand there and hold it for for a while. Our guys like it because it makes them look a little silly too. So they, <laughs> they enjoy doing that. And then if we if we did get into that scenario, we would be man the rest of the possession from there. Did I see that you have you do sometimes like an outnumber, like six on five to mm -hmm. kind of up the yeah, ante we'll for the put, defense? Yeah, we'll put even more than six out there. Like we'll, we'll go both corners, one on the block, one at the nail, two guard front, and we may just throw a random person in there too. Um, either I'm sure guys. it speeds up the speeds up the deep forces the defense to speed up rotations even more. It does, and it makes you really get better at having active hands too. Like they can make a penetrating pass pretty much whenever they want to. If I'm not if I'm not stunting, if I don't have active hands, if I'm not moving on airtime, if I'm not reading shoulders, like he could be looking here and snap one to the block on me. But that's that's a pretty hard pass, right? And so that's where we're counting on active hands. So they get better at reading shoulders that way, like reading eyes, reading shoulders. Very rarely are you going to throw no look passes against the one three one zone. So you can read those eyes pretty well and, and try to move on airtime and make some plays too. And it helps navigating guys down there on the baseline. There's extra guys down there that aren't going to be there. So if I can get through it when there's four guys down here, then I can get through it when there's three. 